Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us here on the network where we cover the most interesting live trials and legal stories in the news today. We're gonna be live in two different courtrooms. We have a lot that we plan to cover for you, so let's get started right now. Okay, let's talk about this right now. Joining me is Law & Crime legal analyst, Matthew Mangino. Matthew, great to see you here. Good morning to you. I wanna start right now with these text messages. What do you make of it? Well, those text messages um, are uh, very uh, important to this case and, and very um, uh, significant with regard to the, the, the defendant in this case. It places him, um, according to the victim, uh, at her home knocking on the door. Um, you know, this, this information is being presented at this point without the jury being present. This is testimony that ultimately uh, may be presented at trial, but it certainly puts uh, the defendant at the victim's home. Yeah, she. Th this actually was allowed in. Um, and the, the question, of course, is, you know, and this was a brilliant defense move on what I thought. I'm curious what you think. The defense seemed to suggest that, well, if you look at what she said, he was, it was the man who cut the yard, seeming to suggest that he left because there was a period of time between when she sent the first message and the second message. Do you buy that? Do you say, hey, well, maybe it was him, but maybe it's not the person who broke in and killed her? Well, certainly that's a possibility, but this is only one portion of the case that the prosecution intends to, to present. Certainly looking at something like that, uh, you know, in a vacuum without considering other evidence might seem to, to leave some doubt, but when you when you put it together with the other pieces of this puzzle, uh, you know, I think uh, the prosecution uh, can make a, a viable case uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, you, you had mentioned the text messages coming in. There was a big issue whether or not they were going to be let in. The defense said that this was hearsay. The prosecution said this was an exception to hearsay, and hearsay is basically an out-of-court statement that's offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted. It's basically saying, is it fair that you can have this out-of-court statement that's saying, well, you know, she's identifying Roy Coons as the person who was knocking on that door. I mean, we don't have the victim to come up here and testify and be cross-examined. Let's listen to what the defense had to say because they were trying to get these text messages thrown out. I don't know, Matthew. I mean, the defense made a good argument. Should these messages have been let, let in to the courtroom for the jury to hear? I think they should. Um, you know, under the uh, federal rules of evidence and in most states, uh, for instance, in my state in Pennsylvania, we've adopted those uh, federal rules of evidence. Um, you know, there's, there's Rule 804, which specifically says that an unavailable witness, especially one whose unavailability has been made um, or, or was caused by uh, the defendant, um, uh, is an exception to hearsay. So, so there's no question both sides uh, acknowledge that this is hearsay evidence. This is a statement made out of court, uh, which is being presented to prove the, the matter asserted, but there are exceptions uh, and, and a long list of exceptions to hearsay. And um, although the defense is you know, uh, ardently trying to keep this evidence out of the courtroom, uh, it clearly um, should be uh, admitted as an exception to hearsay. Always important to hear what the victim had to say right before those final moments. And here, I mean, this is really bad news for the defense. The question is, if the defense was successful in getting those messages thrown out, would the prosecution really have a strong case? I mean, if you look at the totality of the evidence against Mr. Coons, is it strong? Well, I mean, we, we expect that there's going to be evidence with regard to DNA. Uh, there, there's uh, a, a sample, apparently, that was taken from a, a window that uh, was removed in order to enter uh, the premises. There's going to be a number of uh, DNA experts who are going to testify uh, in this case, as I understand it. Uh, you know, so, yeah, you can still... Uh, build a case uh, based on circumstantial evidence. This is an individual who uh, we know uh, lives in the area, you know, is frequently around um, the victim's home. Um, uh, you know, so I think you can, you can still move forward, but certainly uh, this evidence uh, with regard to the uh, telephone statement of the victim is important. Yeah, I mean, the flip side of it is the DNA on that window, and I think there was also DNA of his on a cigarette butt found in the home, 
you know, he did work for them. He also did work for the previous occupant of that home. So it wouldn't be so surprising that his DNA would be there. He lived right by them. But then again, prosecution's trying to put on a case and those text messages were so important. I'll tell you what, we're gonna take a break. When we come back, we have a lot more to break down for what's been happening in this trial. Stay tuned.